Hey, hi everyone. My name is Johan Medrano and I'm a postdoc at the Welcome Center for Human Neuroimaging and I'm going to teach the lecture on dynamic causal modeling for cross-spectral densities. So let's get started. So we will start with a motivating example. Um, in this example, local field potential data were acquired from mice uh, during retrieval of, of fair memory learned in the Pavlovian conditioning paradigm using acoustic tones, so CS plus and CS minus, and the food shock. So in the case of the tone CS minus, there wasn't a shock. In the case of the uh, CS plus, there was a food shock that was delivered. So in this example, um, a previous analysis of this data uh, showed the, the importance of the theta rhythm um, uh, around like 5 hertz um, during the fear memory, so during the CS plus uh, trial. So previous work has demonstrated that uh, the theta band coupling between the CA1 of the hippocampus and the lateral nucleus of the amygdala, LA, uh, has been increased during the presentation of the CS plus, so the trial that was followed by the food shock. Um, and so the theta synchrony onset was correlated with a freezing, which is a behavioral index of fair memory. So um, the data here represent quasi-stationary signals that are characterized by small time variation of the signal strength. So uh, these data, are the, the, the brain responses are quite steady state in the sense that the frequency estimates uh, have like a constant spectral amplitude. Uh, and in, in, this, um, in this work, we will try to model this with a, a DCM for steady state response and for cross-spectral densities. So the purpose here is to demonstrate how DCM for CSD uh, can be used with the data of a single animal and show and it kind of relate back this on off of the theta synchrony um, to the neurobiological mechanism underlying this um, uh, underlying this condition. So the, the goal here is to explain how the experimental manipulation are changes uh, are changing the data feature. And the feature here are the rhythmic oscillations, and we want to relate the change and the measure spectrum back to the neurobiology. So the outline of this lecture, first we will go through like a, a kind of a technical preamble uh, to just introduce you to cross-spectral densities and Fourier transform. And then uh, we will go on to uh, writing the generative model, which is the model of cortical colon and how to wire them together. Then we will see a bit of a uh, more technical thing on uh, dynamic causal modelings and go back to our example. And then we will have a, a final um, a final few slide on practical guidelines, resources, and concluding remarks. So let's start with data and features. So here I will mainly take, talk about things that apply to MEG or EG or uh, local field potential, that is measures of the variation of the electromagnetic field. Uh, not that the DCM for CSD has also been uh, implemented for steady state response of the fMRI signal, so what you learn here can also be applied to fMRI data. And you've already learned in previous lectures uh, of the SPM course how the, um, how the measures of MEG or EG or LFP are relating to currents that in the brain. Okay, so now the question is from this measured uh, fluctuation of the electromagnetic field, how can we unveil within it some uh, oscillatory components? So for this, we can leverage Fourier theorem that says that any function can be represented as a weighted term of complex sinusoids, where the weights are actually complex values. So you can see this in the illustration on the top, um, on the top right corner, where you can see that this square sine waves is increasingly better modeled by a sum, a weighted sum of sinusoids with different uh, frequencies. So the way uh, Fourier works, the Fourier transform works, is by uh, projecting our signal X onto a complex sinusoids. 
So here, the signal in the frequency domain, that is the Fourier transform of our signal, is obtained by taking the signal in the time domain and then doing an orthogonal projection for like a dot product of our time onto complex sinusoids with frequency f. So then the important uh, characteristics of the spectrum that, that can be derived from the uh, Fourier coefficients are the, its amplitude. So that's the magnitude of the Fourier coefficient at each frequency. And this is here like denoting the amplitude of the sine wave, which is the, the radius of this circle. The second important characteristic is the phase. Uh, which is the argument of the of the Fourier coefficient and just gives an idea of the the kind of starting angle of this um, of the complex sinusoid. So it can see it as shifting the complex sinusoid, um, shifting the phase of the of the complex sinusoid. And the last uh, property or important characteristics is the power spectral density that kind of gives um, an intuition on how the power carried by a signal is spread out across different frequencies. And this is given by the squared magnitude of the Fourier coefficients. And now, um, so we want to move from the spectral density of one signal to the cross spectral density, which characterizes the joint power of two signals at particular frequencies. And for this, uh, it's quite convenient to give you another introduction to the power spectral density for the winner kinchin theorem. Um, so we said that the power spectral density that you can uh, see here as written SXX is the squared uh, magnitude of the Fourier coefficients. And another quanti important quantity for a signal, in particular if the signal has some kind of stochastic nature, is its autocorrelation. So the autocorrelation is basically the correlation between a signal X and a lagged version of itself. So uh, the autocorrelation function that we can see here as R is the correlation between the signal X and the signal shifted by a time delay tau. And so the winner kinchin theorem is a very important result, very easy to prove, that relates the power spectral density to the autocorrelation function. And basically what the winner kinchin theorem says is that the power spectral density is the Fourier transform of the autocorrelation function. And so that gives you a hint on how we can apply this to compute cross spectral density. So, um, so we can think of leveraging this winner kinchin theorem to define a cross-spectral density. For this, we can construct a cross-correlation function. So this function is similar to the autocorrelation function, uh, with the only difference that it is defined as the correlation between the signal X and lag version of the signal Y. In other words, in, you just delay the signal y by tau and compute its correlation between, with x, and you've got the cross correlation function. From this, uh, we can compute the cross spectral density by taking the Fourier transform of the cross correlation function. And uh, you can see that the, the cross spectral density um, seen under this way, it gives you, um, it reflects the cross correlation structure between the two signals spread out over different frequency. So it gives insight on the cross correlation at different frequencies. And so it's an important data feature to analyze, say, the effective or functional connectivity between uh, two, signal, two signals. So um, just to make a little summary of what we've seen now, uh, we want to model the steady state fluctuation of the magnetic field. And we want to look at this fluctuation spread out over different frequencies. And for this, we have seen that we can compute the orthogonal projection of the signal onto complex sinusoids, and that's the Fourier transform. And then we can compute the power spectral density of a signal. And if we've got two signals, we can also measure the cross spectral density. And this gives us an insight on the coupling and the cross correlation spread out across frequencies. And the next um, so the next step is to relate this frequency back to the neurophysiology. 
So for this, we want to be modeling the within region activity first. So before looking at the coupling between regions, we want to just focus on one particular bit of the brain and see like how we can model it. So the models that we that are used in this game are usually biophysical models of cortical sources. And the thing is that the cortex has a very particular, a very specific architecture. So a large uh, portion of the cortex has this very organized architecture where the neurons are organized in layers. And these layers go from one to six. Um, that is from the pile, the pile surface to the white matter. And each layer type, um, or each different layer is characterized by high concentration of specific type of neurons, and that's how they are defined. Now, um, the cortex has also this property of being organized into columns. And so these are like showing some kind of form of cellular patterns, and more specifically, the cortical column have particular connectivity patterns within and between layers. And uh, these connectivity patterns are kind of standard, and they make things some. They make some other thing of them as building block of cortical information processing. So this is the idea of like a con canonical microcircuit that is reproduced across the cortex. So the the approach followed by DCM. Um, so, so you've got this canonical microcircuit that is reproduced across the cortex, and um, and then that is supposed to do some intrinsic information processing and um, and receive connection from other areas in the brain. And the approach, model, the modeling approach followed by DCM, is to kind of look at the region and then uh, model the average activity of a cortical column in that region. And then we will see how we can. Um, uh, model the connectivity between different regions. So if we have a closer look at, uh, at a column, um, uh, we, we kind of can gain insight of, on how to model it. So in the layer four, uh, there is mostly granular cells, which are a various type of cells with very small cell bodies. And because of these granular cells, the layer four is called the granular layer, and it can be thought of some kind of an input to the cortical column in a sense that it receives connection from the thalamus and from other cortical regions. And then it projects mostly within the column. That is, it has connection to the infragranular layers, um, so layer five and six, and the supragranular layers, that is layer one and three, uh, one, two, three. In the infragranular layers, we've got, um, so there can be thought as uh, the output towards lower regions, the, that is like regions that are closer to sensory data. Um, and the infragranular layer layers receive modulatory connection from higher regions. And the infragranular layers contain large pyramidal neurons that are aligned and they give, uh, so physically aligned, and they give rise to the large fluctuation of the electromagnetic field that can then be measured outside of the brain with EEG and MEG. Then the supragranular layers can be thought of the output toward higher regions, to a more integrated information, and it should modulatory connection from higher regions as well. So in DCM, these cortical columns are modeled using ten, uh, neural mass models. Um, so neural mass model contains several interacting neural, po neural population, uh, usually three or four interaction neural population. Uh, a neural population is supposed to be composed of neurons with the same kind of parameters, and the activity of a population reflects the activity of tens of thousands of neurons. So the activity of the entire column is modulated by both the intrinsic connectivity, which is between populations, and the self-inhibition of each population, which is the, the inhibitory effect that the population has on itself. And all of the parameters within a, within a neural mass have biophysical meaning. So they are like either time constants or like average number of synaptic pro uh, projections or like things with very physical meaning. And the type of neural mass models that you will see in DCM uh, are three or four population with the free population model as um, spinning state from the granular layer. 
uh, then inhibitory interneurons that are shown in red, and then uh, pyramidal neurons. And the move from the free population model to the far population model is made by uh, distinguishing the contribution of deep and superficial pyramidal neurons. So the far population model is known as the canonical microcircuit, and it is really interesting because um, as it's distinguishing between the superficial and deep pyramidal neurons, it is also distinguishing between uh, the functional role that are played by the by each of these neurons, so the uh, infragranular and supragranular pyramidal neurons. Um, and we say that the superficial neurons project to our higher cortical areas and the deep pyramidal neurons project towards lower cortical areas, so it gives a way of, um, so it's very useful into, in, uh, in analyzing predictive coding in the brain. So then having defined this neural mass models. Um, we want to, to look at how they can be used to model spectrum. So these models, uh, what they are uh, in practice is that they, do, they are defined as differential equations, uh, so such as the one that you see here. So if we call Y the signal that we measure from all of our sensor data, um, or, or LFP data, or whatever like our recording modality is, we would have the activity of a column that would be x dot, which is the change in activity, and which is a function of the configuration of the column x, um, or the current activity. U, that would be some input to the column, and then some theta, some parameters, so some interesting connectivity, self-inhibitions, and things like this. And then we would have, the, um, say, the lead field matrix, or some of a projection that will give rise to our observed data. So the only thing that the model is saying is how the activity of each population is supposed to change given the current configuration. So it's, it's really a model of change, it's a differential equation. And so the question is, how can we use this uh, differential equation to, to, to kind of model the cross spectrum density? And then for this, uh, the useful thing is to think of um, is, is to go back to much simpler models that are called linear time invariant systems. Uh, and if we had like a linear time invariant system, that is a system that has the form AX plus BU with Y equals CX, then we could just apply the Laplace or Fourier transform to, to put this model into, into, um, into this form, or, or the, at least the first equation into this form. So G2 PF, uh, G2 by F times X is equal to AX plus BU. And all of these quantities are in the frequency domain now. And that's just because the Laplace of Fourier transform is a linear operation. So it commutes with the linear algebraic operation that you see in the, in the differential equation. And the very nice thing by uh, in the Laplace of Fourier uh, domain or like in the frequency domain is that the temporal derivative, so the derivation of our time, corresponds just to multiplication by J to PF in the frequency domain. So that's a very, very useful feature because um, this equation can be just solved as any algebraic uh, equations. So we just use a bit of linear algebra using like standard linear algebra operation, and we can just um, solve exactly so solve for x uh, as a function of u in this first equation, then do the same thing for y as a function of x, and then we can plug equation one in equation two to get y as a function of u. And what we get is that y is equal to um, some transfer function h of f uh, times u of f. So the output spectra is now directly related to the input spectra. And so the transfer function is relating the, in, the output spectra to the input spectra without any reference to the internal states. So we don't have any more differential equation. Now we've got like a function of frequency that is relating the input frequency to the output frequency. And so you can see, uh, you can think of this transfer function as like kind of the, the modulatory or filtering effect uh, that the cortical column has on the input to that it receives. Now, um, how can we 
how can we, so I said the cortical column, but this is a linear time invariant system. How can we put our cortical column into this uh, kind of framework? So for this, we can assume that our cortical column is operating near some fixed points. So it's operating to, towards like some operating points that within any input, within any noise, it will just um, st st uh, go back steadily to, to this fixed point. And then we can assume that uh, it's, driving, it's driven away from the fixed point by the noise and by the contribution from other columns. And because of this, assuming that the changes are small, um, we can describe the activity approximately by its linearized version. And so we can just take so the gradient of uh, the partial derivative of f with respect to x and the partial derivative uh, with respect to u, and then just write, uh, yeah, this first order or linear uh, approximation to the system. And then same thing for the, the observation function. And then what we've got is actually a linear time invariant system that, are, that is now parameterized by theta, where theta are like the, the parameter of the column, so the intrinsic connectivity, self-inhibition, time constants, and things like this. And so now we've got, we can just apply the, the linear filtering equation that we've had before to, to, to get um, the operation that is computed by the, the approximate operation that is computed by the, uh, in the frequency domain that is uh, operated by the cortical column. So that is the way it transforms the input spectrum to an output spectrum. And here the, fun the transfer function is a function of frequency, so it's some, it's yeah, it, it, it has some effect on each of different frequency, and it is parameterized by these theta parameters of our uh, cortical column. And so, obviously, changing the parameters will change the transfer function. So the transfer function, so I said that it relates the input to the output of the complex spectrum, and the way it's modulated by the parameters is quite interesting because. Um, it is module, each parameter would have a very different um, or specific way of changing the transfer function. So we can say, for instance, here, if we scale the time constant of the excitatory neurons, um, it has the effect of increasing both the broadband uh, and the peak around 10 Hertz, so like the alpha peak of the, of the cortical column. Here, if we uh, scale the time constant of the inhibitory neurons, then it doesn't really change the, the broadband, like the, the the value of the column at or the activity at frequent at zero frequency, but it increases the activity at 10 hertz. So yeah, uh, all of the different parameters will have different effects like this, and you can just play around with the parameter, scale it, and see how it it is changing the output spectrum. So just to give you like a bit of a summary here, we said that local activity is modeled by neural mass model that represents um, that represents several cortical columns or, uh, or like the average activity of, of a cortical column in a particular region. And this model is um, actually modeling the average activity of three or four interacting neuronal populations. And the activity of the entire column is modulated by parameters that all have a very physical meaning. And by linearizing the activity dynamics, we can relate the input to the output spectrum. So we can relate, say, the input to the cortical column to the mesial spectrum at the sensor level, given like some lead film matrix. Uh, and then the transfer function that is operated by the cortical column is modulated by the, by the parameters of the column. So now that we've modeled the activity as a, at a single region, we can go ahead and ask how we can model why your brain regions together and construct a model of this. So the idea here is to integrate between region or extrinsic connectivity in the model, and then to simultaneously model the spectrum in several regions and its effects on the measured um, fluctuation of the electromagnetic potential. So for this, we already saw that um, the different layers of the cortex have different functional roles. And that also means that the way the cortical columns are connected to each other will also have different, function, different uh, functional roles. So we've got 
uh, three types of, of connections that are uh, used in this CM. Uh, the first type is bottom up. So this reflects uh, forward connections or like from lower sensory areas to higher um, areas in the predictive coding hierarchy. And uh, are characterized bit by uh, connection from the supragranular and infragranular layers and to the layer four or granular layer. Then you've got the top down connections that are uh, backwards, um, backward connections from uh, and to supra and infragranular layers. And then you've got lateral connection that kind of reflects regions that are um, connected at, that are like uh, playing a role at the same um, level of sensory pro uh, processing or information processing and that are characterized by connection from the supragranular and infragranular layers onto the free um, the free type of populations and obviously because they don't have exactly the same architecture the canonical microcircuit that is the circuit with far population have slightly different kind of connectivity but here we'll just focus on this because it's the simplest uh, example that you can find so now we so in the previous section I talked about how we can linearize our system to kind of compute the cross spectral density, and um, and, but I didn't really say what was the input. So here we will say a bit more about the input. So the input in DCM for CSD is the background activity. So it's some kind of um, of activity that has this characteristic one over s f power spectrum that is this power low uh, power spectrum and can be thought of as um, polar noise, which is uh, usually the name for stochastic processes with this uh, kind of polar pro spectrum. And so the response of the brain is, um, so you've got the input activity like this, and it's propagating to some regions. So you would have the possibility of specifying which regions are receiving this background activity. And then you've got the response of the interconnected neural mass model, where um, each of the connection is one of the connection type that we've decided um, that we've talked to we talked about in the previous uh, slide. And so this gives rise to different regions at uh, different responses at different regions in the brain that reflects both the processing of the background activity and the processing of the um, of the input from the over cortical regions. Now we are talking in the frequency domain, so all of these are spectrum. So we've got the uh, background activity with this typical one over f um, kind of spectrum that gives rise to all of these uh, responses over all of the different regions. And then you can imagine that with your, say, lead field matrix, you've got the projection of this spectrum onto your sensor and a mix up of all of this that is um, that is observed at the at the sensor level. So we can think of these power spectral densities at different regions and their cross spectral densities as the data features that we want to model. So how do we model this? So to model this, we will just take our differential equation for our neural mass model and integrate in that the coupling between the different regions then repeat the steps that we had before to kind of uh, derive the transfer function for the entire world brain model of the cross spectral density. And then the power spectral density at region I will be modeled by um, some kind of inner product of the spectral density of the noise and the transfer function from the input to the region I. And then the cross spectral density is modeled by the transfer function from input to region I times the spectrum of the, the power spectral density of the noise times the uh, transfer function from input to the spectral density at region J. So that gives you um, a way to compute the, both the power spectral density given some parameters and the cross spectral density given some parameters. So then the question is, how do we model changes in the spectral densities and cross spectral densities between conditions? So we said before that in our motivating example, we had two conditions and these were um, reflected into changes in the cross spectral density. 
And this is something that we're interested in uh, incorporating in our model. So for this, what we would say is we will first introduce a condition one. So we are modeling the data in condition one using a first set of parameters uh, one. Uh, so theta one. Uh, and then we would have condition two and we will simply have the model of the data in condition two, which will be uh, modeled using a set of parameters, uh, say theta two. And um, theta one and theta two don't have to differ, like all of the parameters don't have to differ. Like you can imagine that, uh, for instance, the average number of synaptic, uh, of syn synaptic um, connectivity, but when uh, between two population in the in one region should not change between between two conditions. So only a few parameters will be changed. And I will talk you uh, talk to you later about um, which parameters are changing in DCM. But for now, the um, only important thing is to understand that uh, if you've got n conditions, then you will just have uh, you just make your parameter vary for each condition, and you 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 will use. Uh, this to, to to kind of model each of the conditions. And so the way it works in DCM actually is uh, it's got like a very generic way of um, of specifying the experimental design for modeling the condition specific effects. So you've got some parameters that are common across conditions, say population constants, some that are varied between the trials, say the effective connectivity. And what you will do in this in this year is so you've got all of your trials, all of your conditions, and you will do exactly the same thing as you would do with the general linear model approach. So you will construct a design matrix that will map between conditions onto the trials. So you would um, you would just specify a design matrix like this that says, for instance, like condition four is mapped onto like a few trials, and then like another condition onto another few trials. And then one of them is actually the the baseline. So you would have like some yeah so some design metrics that you will specify that will tell your DCM model what parameters are changing in what what parameters are. So you would you will specify a design matrix that will just say how the conditions are mapped onto trials. And that will give the meaning to your parameters, depending what is changing and not changing. So just to, to make like a brief summary here, just to make a brief summary here. So now we've got a nice functional form for our model, and we also have a way to model condition specific effects. And the, the idea, so we've got our model to model the, the whole brain uh, cross-spectral densities with the regions that we want, uh, the kind of connectivity pattern that we want. So we've constructive, constructed our generative model. And the next step is to to take, um, to to use this model to kind of answer hypothesis. Um, so the, the next things that we will talk about is how to transfer an hypothesis into uh, models and then how to do Bayesian model inversion. So then um, in this scheme, the parameters that you will kind of provide will be the A matrices that will determine which connections are forward, which connections are backward, and which one are lateral connections. Then you will have your B matrix that will specify which connections are being, uh, being changed between conditions. Uh, then you would have the C matrices. So I told you that the background activity or the, the kind of input cortical columns will be um, can be in all of the region of only a subset of them, and this is specified by the C matrix. Then you would have your X matrix, which is the experimental design, which is the design matrix I talked uh, about later uh, before. And then you would have model parameters, which will depend on the type of uh, neural mass model that you've been using that you you're using. And then after specifying this model or this complex DCM model, you have specified a full generative model. That is, you have specified a likelihood. So you can compute given some parameter the probability of the data. And this is because um, there is some kind of noise profile that is assumed gives the probability of the data under a particular model. Then there is also priors. The priors are like the prior probability of the parameters and 
for this in SPM, you don't have too much to think about it because you've already got um, some default values that have been selected from the literature. So unless you've got very strong ideas about what some parameters should be, uh, you can just use the default values in SPM. This kind of particular factorization prescribes the joint distribution of the data and the parameters, which is the blue blob that you can see here. Now, all of the all of the interesting part of all, all of the interesting question of Bayesian inversion is given this prescribed likelihood and priors that prescribe the joint distribution, can I go back to the the other factorization, so the factorization on the other axis, which would be the evidence, so the marginal distribution of the data, and the posterior, which is the probability of the parameters given the data. So basically, we've got this um, prescribed factorization that prescribed this blue blob, and the question of Bayesian inversion is, how oh, can we now um, transfer this into the factorization on the other axis? So the Bayesian inversion is simply the question of how does the joint distribution split between posterior and evidence? Now, usually in practice, this problem is intractable, it's very complicated to solve. And for this, uh, to, we just uh, use an approximate solution to it. And this approximate solution is based on version and inference. So the idea of version and inference is to introduce an approximate posterior and to compute the free energy F. So the free energy F is what you see, can see here on the left-hand side of the equation. Um, and it's equal to uh, the expectation of uh, the approximate posterior, Q of phi, of the um, logarithm of the ratio between the joint distribution and the approximate posterior. So it's just taken, uh, so to compute it, it's very simple. So you take this equation that is base rule, you divide it by, uh, you take the logarithm of it, you subtract the logarithm of the approximate posterior, and you take the expectation under the approximate posterior. And a very interesting thing is that this, because we know we are constructing our approximate posterior, so we know it, we can compute it. We can also compute the joint distribution because we are prescribing it through prescribing the priors and the likelihood. So we can actually compute this quantity. But this quantity is also equal to the to these two terms. So that is the first term is the expectation and the approximate posterior of the difference between the logarithm of the posterior and the logarithm of the approximate posterior plus the logarithm of the evidence or the marginal log evidence. And it's really important to understand that the, this first uh, cement is actually always negative. So, to, so if we were to maximize the free energy, then we would subsequently like minimize the distance between the approximate posterior and the actual posterior. So it's it gives us a tractable quantity that we can that is a lower bound on the evidence, and that we can maximize to retrieve uh, to make our approximate posterior very close to the to the actual posterior. So if we if you look at the at the plot at the bottom bit, um, we can see that we've introduced this approximate posterior Q of phi, and then. The, the one thing about fashion inference is to use traditional gradient methods to increase the free energy with respect to um, Q of phi. So you just do a gradient ascent of the free energy with respect to the parameter of the approximate posterior. And what will happen is that um, the posterior will actually get closer and closer to the, uh, to the actual posterior. And once you've converged, what you what happens is that um, this first term, which is the Kyle divergence, is approximately zero. And that's really nice because that means that we've actually constructed an approximate solution to the Bayesian inversion problem. So we can see that after convergence, after this optimization, F, the free energy, is approximately equal to the log marginal evidence, ln of PFY. And the approximate posterior is actually approximately equal to the actual posterior. Using the variational free energy, we've got 
um, because it's an approximation to the marginal model evidence, we can use it to do inference on the model structure and to this enables Bayesian model comparison. And then using the approximate posterior, we can do inference on the model parameters and do Bayesian parameter averaging and things like this. So now what is Bayesian model comparison and Bayesian model selections? So let's say that we've got two hypotheses. So hypothesis one is that A, region A, is driving region B. So as, say, uh, backward connections to, uh, forward connections to region uh, B and then forward connections to region C. And then the, the hypothesis, hypothesis two is that region A is driving both region B and C. So Adding these two hypotheses will nicely translate into two different models where we can see that um, the connectivity between the connection. So model one has a connection between region B and C, while model two doesn't have this connection, but instead has a connection between A and C. So it reflects the, the two hypotheses. So now we want to mitigate between this and arbitrate between these two hypotheses using variational inference and Bayesian uh, approximate Bayesian inference. So to do this, we just do our gradient descent and the variational free energy using our models. Um, and we iter iteratively increase the free energy. Our approximate posterior for both models becomes closer to the true posterior under this model. And we obtain a free energy F1 for model M for model one and the free energy F2 for model two. Now we can see that one model has a free energy that is higher than the second model. And so because the free energy is higher, it means that the log, L, the, the log marginal evidence is higher and differences in log marginal evidence is a quantity called log base factor that um, you will learn about in, in the subsequent talk of the SPM course. And it gives you a measure of, um, of the statistical significance for one or like the evidence uh, for one model. So if the log base factor is positive, then you've collected. Um, so if the last, if the difference between the free energy between model two and model one is positive, you've collected evidence towards model uh, model one. So in that case, we say that the free energy for model one is is higher than the free energy for model two. The base factor is positive or is towards like model one, and then um, that means that. Uh, the best explanation for the data at hand is hypothesis, uh, hypothesis one. So just to give you like a brief summary, Bayesian inversion is just the problem of uh, finding the posterior and evidence from the likelihood and the prior, and you can get an approximate solution using variation and inference. And just in short, that means that you fit an approximate posterior by using a gradient ascent and the variational free energy. And after optimization, you would collect the evidence and the approximate posterior, and you can use the evidence to arbitrate between hypotheses that you can translate into models. So now let's get back to our motivating example that we were first talking about, uh, that we start our lecture with. So it was this Pavlovian con conditioning paradigm in mice, uh, in mice with distance CS minus that is followed by nothing and distance CS plus that is followed by a full chunk. And we want to study um, fair memory retrieval. So we had said that um, there was an increased theta coupling between the hippocampus and the lateral nucleus of the amygdala uh, that was uh, observed during the CS plus. So now let's think about this and putting it into a DCM for cross spectral density. So let's think about the problem setting. We've got two regions. The first is the lateral, lateral nucleus of the amygdala and then CA1 of the hippocampus. Then we've got two conditions, which is CS minus, the tone that is not followed by the foot shock, and CS plus, the tone that is followed by the foot shock. And then the effect of interest is the modulatory effect of um, CS plus as compared to CS minus on the connectivity between the two regions and possibly within the region. So we've got a few unknowns or things that we don't have an idea about uh, how to specify it. Um, so these unknowns are the type of connections. So what are what kind of connections are between the two regions? Um, what are the inputs? So which regions are receiving the background brain activity or like the one over F activity? 
And then what is the directionality of the connections? Uh, is it from CA1 to LA or from LA to CA1 or both? And so to answer all of this question, we just resort to Bayesian model comparison. But before using Bayesian model comparison, uh, we first need to specify our design matrix that reflects our experimental design. So for this, uh, we would have two conditions. We have our two type of trials. We've got the trials that are CS minus and the trials that are CS plus, and we're interested in modeling the change in connectivity from CS minus to CS plus. We will model the average cross spectral densities in all of the CS minus trials and all of the average cross spectral density in all of the CS plus trials. And to do this, um, to, to model this uh, change in connectivity, we would have a very simple design matrix, which has only one color, and that will be zero for the average trials uh, for the average CSD in the CM minus condition and then uh, one for the average CSD in the CS plus condition. So basically it will just say um, that the A matrices will be estimated from both conditions. So they are like kind of a baseline, something that is common. And then the condition specific effect is something that is um, added to this baseline connectivity in only in the CS plus condition. And this is what is conveyed by this design matrix. Then we need to determine which is the best model or like the most adequate model to explain our data features. So the first question that we wanted to answer is what kind of connection is there in between the two regions that we've selected? So just to remind you, there is three type of connection that we can choose from uh, with like the free region, free population model. The first type is bottom up, the second one is top down, and the third one is lateral connections. So in this study, the author selected five models that were the most adequate to explain the data. Um, and this model feature either bottom up um, connections, so in, with plain lines, top gun, down connection with the dash dot lines, lateral connection with dotted lines, and then like a mix of either bottom up and top down or all of the three connection types. So these are like all of the five models that have been considered in, in evaluating the connectivity types. So then the in the studies, they did like the model inversion for all of these models using the maximization of the variational free energy, so variational inference um, that I told you about, told you about before and what they computed is the log base factor so you can see that as the difference in free energy um, as compared to the model with the lowest free energy which is here model three so this model and you can see that uh, the log base factor is very high for the model one um, large for model four and five and um, smaller for model two and so in that case, the winning model is model one. It, uh, it's got like a base factor as compared to model three of about 55 and also a base factor as compared uh, of about 15 as compared to model four and five, which means that it is way more probable. Uh, just to give you an idea, a log base factor of three is actually conveying that a, a model is 20 times more probable than another model. After observing this plot, we can conclude that the connectivity type that is the best to explain our data is the bottom-up connectivity between the two regions. Then the question is, the, the next question is, where should we put the inputs? So either in both regions, only in CA1 or only in LA. So these are the three hypotheses and they are um, conveyed by the three models here. And we can see one once again that model one is the winning model. It's got like um, the highest free energy and it's got uh, even as compared to model two, which is the second best, it's got a quite a quite a, a large increase in the log base, fa log base factor. So it means that the input should enter both, mod both regions. Then the third question is about the connectivity direction. So should we have bidirectional connection between LA and CA1? Should we have um, connection only from CA1 to LA or only from LA to CA1. 
So once again, we do va using variation and inversion, we can just compare this free type of model. And here we've got a log base factor of 160, about 160 for model one. And then it means that this is the winning model because the other ones have much less uh, log base factor. And so the connectivity direction is bidirectional between the two regions. So here we've determined what is the best model for explaining the, the data that we that we have. Um, and the overall winning model is this model one that has big directional forward connections with inputs in both regions. So having determined this best model, we can have a look at how it's able to predict the data features. And that's an important thing because you want to model to have like a large base factor, but also to be a, to, to, to be better than the other models, but also to be a good model of your data or a good model of the features that you're trying to explain. So now if we look at the data fits, we can see, so the plain line here is the modeled data or like the predicted by the model and the dotted lines here will be actually the, the, the observation of the measured uh, cross-spectral density. And what we can see is that the, the model is actually having a, doing a very good job at explaining the change in cross-spectral density between the two conditions and also the, the spectral density in both of the regions. So note that we have verified that our model is able to explain our features of interest. We can have a look in the parameters and try to understand what is the change in the neurophysiology that explain these data features. So for this, um, we will look at the effect of interest in the approximate posterior, and we will look for the modulatory effect of the condition on the different connection so types. So we will first start with uh, the intrinsic connectivity, so the effect on the intrinsic connectivity. So here you will see the connection strength or like the yeah the interesting connect the average interesting connectivity between reg between the populations um, well in the cs minus it will always be 100 percent and it's this is just because um, our design matrix has a zero here and it has a one here so we will just have 100 percent here and uh, something that is changed as compared to this that will convey like an increase or decrease in the connectivity. So in the hippocampus, we say that there is no particular effect of the condition, but in the lateral nucleus of the amygdala, we've got an increase of the connectivity by about 8% uh, in the CS plus condition as compared to the CS minus condition. Doing the same kind of plot for the extrinsic connectivity, we can see that uh, the CS plus condition increases the connectivity between the hippocampus and the amygdala by about 26% and decreases the connectivity between the amygdala and the hippocampus by about 72%. Now, after doing all of this analysis and doing Bayesian model selection and looking at the effect of interest and all the parameters are changed by the condition, you are in a nice position to just write your result section and then discuss it in the in the discussion. So in this particular example, the authors write, in summary, these results suggest that the hippocampus and the amygdala influence each other for the bi for bidirectional connections. So this was the result of the Bayesian model selection space. And steady state responses induced by CS plus relative to CS minus stimuli appear to increase the intrinsic sensitivity of postsynaptic response in the amygdala. So that was the effect of the condition on the intrinsic connectivity. And with an additional sensitization to extrinsic afference from the hippocampus. So this was the plus 28% increase in the connection strength between the hippocampus and the amygdala. At the same time, the reciprocal influence of the amygdala on the hippocampus is suppressed, and this was the 72% decrease of the connection strength between the amygdala and the hippocampus. So you can see that here, after inverting our DCM, we've got a very nice way to do model selection and to justify what kind of model we will use to explain this particular data. And after selecting our model, we've got a very, very nice way 
to kind of look in the approximate posterior, look for the effects of interest, and kind of understand how our connection, uh, our condition is modulating, for instance, the connection or the in intrinsic connections. So all the connectivity is changed by the condition. So now we've concluded our example. Uh, we saw how GCM can be used in the frequency domain to explain pro-spectral density and cross-spectral density and their modulation across different conditions, and then relate this back to the neurobiology. And I just wanted to rehearse a few guidelines to get you started in practice. And that is because, in general, there is a lot of different methods that are involved in DCM. They have been introduced over more than 20 years, so it can be a bit frightening to, to get started with it. But in practice, though, we, we've seen how DCM can make the writing of the result section very easy and very standardized, and it's a very well um, rigorous method to, to kind of analyze your data and relate uh, data features to neurobiology. So the first thing I would say is that it's really important that you know what are your hypotheses and what are the implications in terms of the neurobiology. So in general, it's a nice idea to start with a clear research question that you want to answer with DCM. This question, if you want to use DCM, should be about connectivity or self-modulation of the, of the cortical columns. And in particular, they change as compared to, say, a baseline or a change or variation between conditions. And it's often useful when you know what your hypotheses are in playing in terms of brain response or in terms of neuromodulations. So most of the simple DCM analysis are structured in the same way. So you first figure out your question, get your data, and then create a model that reflects your different hypotheses. And then invert this model your Bayesian model selection to arbitrate, and then you can do inference of parameters. And then you would see in like sub subsequent talk, or you can also do crop level studies to, to infer uh, on parameter and parameter change at the group level. And that would be uh, the topic of Peter's talk. The second advice would be to have an interesting model space. So we've seen that in the pre in the in the example, um, although there was a lot of connectivity type that could be chosen uh, or selected, the authors only selected five different models that were likely for this data. And so the model space here in DCM would be the kind of connectivity or modulatory pattern that you would be investigating. And sometimes it could be very confusing to have too many models that you're uh, comparing. And in particular, if some of them don't really make sense in a neurobiological uh, point of view. So it's really nice to use, like the, the good practice is to use anatomical, structural, and computational knowledge to kind of refine your model space and the kind of models that you will be investigating. Then another uh, advice is that a simple, well-designed experiment is always easier to model. And so it's a really good thing to have in mind what your design matrix will look like before running the experimental. Uh, in particular, you can test whether the parameters are estimable by checking that the currents are linearly independent. And sometimes it's easier to change the experimental design than to try to model ill-designed experiment, Ill experiments. And a very simple example for this is that if you put all of your uh, rest condition in one run and all of your condition uh, in all of your test condition in a different run, uh, then no model will be able to distinguish between the between run effect and the between condition effect. So a quick tip is to uh, put all of your confounding effect as regressors in the um, in a design matrix uh, and see whether like there is they are collinear with the um, effect of interest. And if so, just update your experimental design. And then uh, you can find more advices of this sort by reading the 10 simple rules for dynamic causal modeling paper in NeuroImage. Uh, and that's, yeah, that contains a lot of very good advices or practical guidelines uh, that you might want to, to use in your analysis. And then just um, 
just to mention, if you want to find resources, you can find them on the website, so the SPM website, in the SPM book that you can find online. And also you can ask questions for the SPM mailing list. OK, so now we've reached the end of the lecture. I'm just going to summarize uh, what we've seen so far and just give you like the briefly the future direction for this and for CSDs. So we've seen that cross spectral density kind of measures the cross correlations between two signals at different frequency, and it can be used to model steady state responses. The neuron mass model that are modeling cortical columns can be used to construct these models with observed data, and you can model whole brain uh, cross spectral density using a few region specific models that are like interconnect interconnected in specific ways that reflects the the biology or the biophysical connections. Then you can use dynamic causal modeling to infer model parameters using functional based methods and use Bayesian model comparison to arbitrate between different models that convey different hypotheses. But just to give you uh, a bit on the future direction, this aim has been recently extended to accommodate different types of neural mass models. So it means that you're not um, only using models that are uh, models of the cortical sources, but you can also use your own model of deep sources. So that can be useful, for instance, to study Parkinson's disease. And then the future of dcm 4 csd is not only in modeling steady state response, but also time frequency response, where you can have some kind of assumption of separation of temporal scales between the, um, the fluctuation of the spectral density and uh, and the actual oscillatory power uh, on the actual oscillatory activity. And this is something that you can see in adiabatic DCM. So this is all for this lecture. Uh, I will thank you for your attention. Thank you. Um, thank Mansouri and Olivia for organizing the course. And if you have any question, bring please uh, bring them to the to the Q and A just after. Uh, and I'm just uh, gonna leave you on this list of reference and related papers. It can be very useful to to read some of them. Uh, yeah, to have like a, a better understanding of DCM for CSD. Thank you.